Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending from wherever you are. I'm coming from Bay Area, San Jose, uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, my name is Jimmy. I am a senior data scientist, as they call me at LinkedIn. Still there, like I said, I haven't gotten laid off yet. I know that's definitely a current these days. But I think my career actually started in finance, and then I did a stint actually in HR and compensation, but really wanted to be a data scientist. So pushed really hard to, to become one and became one. Uh, failed a bunch of times, but eventually was able to pass the interviews and here I am uh, living what I think is, is my dream. So having fun and uh, hoping to share a little bit of wisdom with everyone here. Hi everyone, thanks Yumi. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Vasama. I am a principal PM manager at Microsoft in the Azure databases team. I've been at the data and AI space for over 15 years. Uh, I'm a first generation immigrant to the US, uh, really passionate about diversity, equity and inclusion in the tech space, specifically mm -hmm. in data and AI and uh, really excited to learn from my fellow panelists here and uh, from all of your questions. Uh, from a machine learning perspective, my, I am actually the reverse. So I actually started my career as a data scientist and uh, published research in heart attack detection systems and ML algorithms, uh, which are currently used in EKG machines around the world. Um, so really uh, using a machine learning model in production where it's uh, used every single day with thousands of machines around the world. Currently, I am uh, kind of owning the product perspective of things from how people deploy applications using databases, how they do AI on top of that in Microsoft. So again, really bringing in the reverse uh, side of things and what business side of things are there. So again, here to learn from all of you, answer any questions and excited to get this going. Nick, cool. passing over to you. Hello, everybody. My name is Nick Singh. I'm calling in from right outside Washington, DC. I've been lucky enough to work at Facebook, Google, and uh, geospatial analytics startup SafeGraph. I'm also the best-selling author of this book called Ace the Data Science Interview. It's the number one bestseller in data science on Amazon. And I'm also the founder of SQL Interview Practice Platform data lemur some of y'all might have seen this on linkedin it has about fifty six thousand users using it to practice wow. sql and i'm really passionate about helping people get their first few jobs in data science but in particular how to ace the tricky technical interview process that's what mm. i specialize in and that's what i love to figure out yeah that's yeah. awesome hi everyone my name is avery smith i love data like i love all things data and data analytics i've done a lot of different things in the data world but i didn't start as a data person i actually studied chemical engineering and I was a chemical lab technician, so I wore like the white coat, the goggles, the glove, and I got to play with chemicals like TNT and chloroform and other like really cancer provoking. So I kind of broke into the data fields in a bunch of different ways, went through a really long journey. But now I'm here. I've worked as a data analyst and data scientist at a biotech startup, I worked for ExxonMobil, obviously really big oil and gas major. Yeah. And then I ran my own consulting firm. And now I run an education platform called Data Career Jumpstart, where I help people. I and mean, it's just a pleasure being here. And I'm just stoked to be here with these panelists. These are awesome people. And I can't wait to learn from them as well. So thank you for having me. Uh, Jimmy, I think we had a few set questions. I know the questions are rolling in, but I remember mm -hmm. beforehand, we had talked about a few hot button topics that just keep coming up. So yeah. I wanted to just kick it off because I know a lot of y'all in the audience are curious. Like, do you need a master's or PhD Mm -hmm. to break into data science or to be a data scientist. And I'm curious here on the panelists, does who here has a master's, who has a, you know, have only undergraduate degrees? I want to hear from what your mm -hmm. takes are. So I had an undergrad and did a double, double major in undergrad, finance and math. And then I, I did a master's part-time in data science. Master's part-time in statistics over the course of seven years. Yeah. So working <laughs> full-time and <laughs> uh, did a master's part-time. But I mean, everyone's journey is different, right? I think that, that the key thing behind that is continuous learning, right? And then applying it to the job. Yeah. That's some serious grit. I mean, seven years is no no joke. So I'm glad you got it done, man. That's yeah. That's they, they, they told me after seven, if uh, if I didn't graduate, my class was from 2013. I graduated in 2020. They told me, well, if I didn't graduate in 2020, my class was from 2013 would expire. So I'd be stuck in a perpetual loop. So oh. I had to I had to close out. Right. <laughs> I had to close it out. Love it. How about you, Mazuma Avery? What's your guys' background? Yeah, I can go uh, next. So yeah, I don't have a PhD uh, or master's in this field. Uh, I have undergraduate in software engineering and I've been working since then. But I do have research in uh, machine learning, which was published and that's been used. So uh, simple answer to your question is no, you don't need a master's or a PhD to work in data, work in machine learning or work in AI. You can come from various different backgrounds. Uh, what is unique about you? And we are going to talk more about that in this session itself. So you don't need a specific degree. Yes, if you are doing particular research and that research team is looking at a particular PhD uh, kind of education, then yes, uh, for a particular role that might apply too. 
Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I have a master's, but it was after I got my third data job. So definitely don't need a master's degree. I got kind of lucky. I studied data science, but not really in undergrad. I studied systems and information engineering, which is kind of like industrial engineering or operations research. Mm. And that's kind of already a mix of like business and applied math. And then I minored in computer science. So even though I don't have the title of undergrad in data science, it sort of already was coding and math and business. So I, I kind of lucked out there. Yeah. I don't know. What do you guys think? I, I feel like it's more, it's just in general, I think the field can be best described as maybe just problem solving with data, right? And there's many ways to approach that. And it's not necessarily like one cut background that, hey, you're fit to fit in this. It's more like, do you have the knowledge to solve the problem in the most efficient way, the technique to solve it or the whatever skill you need to solve in the most efficient way? That's that's how I view it. What do you guys think? Yeah, hundred percent. I think I agree on that one. It's bringing your problem solving skill using data and your curiosity, I would say. So a lot of time you have to figure out how, and then of course the people skill and soft skill side of things are very, very important. So if you know how to solve problems, be it from an engineering perspective yeah. or any of the previous backgrounds that kind of are transferable skills, uh, you can be a right fit in any of the data teams. And I really, really recommend to understand what that person in that role does in the data job try to talk to those folks who are doing that in that particular team and organization if yeah. possible and go from there because that will give you a lot of insights into what deliverables they are for that team, what makes an exceptional data scientist or a data engineer or data analyst or whatever role you are going in this data field, ML engineer, and then go from there. List it down and understand the gap and go from those skills perspective. I just see a question in the chat, which is kind of related to this. Avery, you went through multiple careers before you got into data science. Someone's wondering. So how did you kind of think about that journey? Because I know there's a lot of career transitioners probably here in the talk. Yeah. So when I like was in high school, I really liked math and I really liked chemistry. And so I thought, oh, I'll just combine them and do chemical engineering. And I quickly found out that I hated it and it wasn't for me, uh, which a lot of you guys might feel the same way. And so I guess it was more that, man, I really don't like what I'm doing right now. What can I do instead? And so some of the things that I didn't like about being a chemical engineer or like a chemical lab technician was one, I was dealing with dangerous chemicals. And also it was like, you'd like mix things and like test tubes and stuff. And turns out I have like no dexterity. Like I would spill like chemicals all over my hands all the time. And so I was like, okay, done with like the manual stuff. I'm not good at that. Um, no more cancer chemicals. And then for me, a big thing was I loved working remotely and I still love working remotely. And as a chemical engineer, I was never going to really be able to do that. And so I realized, man, I have to get something where I could work remotely. And then another thing I really hated about chemical engineering is it your your like experiments would take hours or even weeks. Mm -hmm. And now in like data analytics, you can do something in like 0.5 seconds and then, oh, it didn't work. I'll just try something else. And so I loved how fast it was, how remote and how flexible it was. And so I was like, okay, I got to get more into, into that. And one of the cool things about data analytics is it's really industry agnostic. Like I was a data analyst. Sure. In, in chemical engineering, right? But whatever you do right now, whatever your industry in, you can just apply data to it and it becomes a little bit nicer of a job and you don't have to switch injury, industries unless you want to and you could totally can do that as well. So I just love the flexibility that this industry gives me. Piggybacking off of that, I think Avery, you said something very interesting that these data skills can be applied to every industry. But I've noticed something for people trying to break in because I know a lot of people are trying to get their first job in data. I found better success for the people I've coached if they just stick to their industry, right? Like if you're background in chemical engineering, getting that first job in data as a data analyst for a chemical company or chemical engineering firm is so much easier. And then after that, you can go do anything. But for that first job, I've, I've recommended teachers to do ed tech or finance people to go work at a fintech company or something like that. I don't know if you guys have seen something like that before, or I think, Jimmy, did you sort of do that yourself in your... Yeah, it was pretty... Uh... Uh, I think the nice thing, I think Avery, you touched on this a little bit, but like, I think it's pretty ubiquitous. Um, it, again, going back to what I said earlier about just problem solving with data. Um, I, I think um, even in, in, in the, when I was in the HR space, there was like this HR analytics field that was coming up, right? People analytics, right? Where you'd answer questions like attrition and just, I mean, there was a lot of reporting as well, but you try to do things like predict of attrition or uh, I was trying to predict who would accept the job offer and what's the amount that you were supposed to give, right? Um, but um, yeah, it, it's... It's really just trying to help inform the business to make the right decision at the right time, right? Um, and as a data scientist, data analyst, business analyst, whatever you want to call yourself, right? Uh, that's the, the, the spectrum that you work on. Um, I think the other thing is like 
one is like, I guess the domain, I think is what you were touching on, right, Nick? But the other part, I think is also like the te technical depth, right? How, how deep do you want to go? I think, Wazma, you definitely went pretty deep on the ML side, right? The research side, which I consider to be pretty deep, right? Um, but how, how close do you want to be to the business and consulting with leaders versus pushing like machine learning models to production, right? There's also that dimension as well. So depending on those two things is kind of where I would guide uh, someone to go, yeah. I'll add one thing to it. So thanks for, for pointing that out. I think it uh, there's a lot of confusion, and especially for somebody who's starting off, would to understand what are the different roles, right? So yeah. there are so many roles created. And then if you really look at their job description, what they really do is not what's advertised with the title of the job. So don't just go with the title. I would highly recommend to understand what it means to be that person or that role in that team or org. Uh, and that's where you understand all the things, what you were, Jimmy was just mentioning about the domain knowledge, the technical skills and the soft skills, which are mm -hmm. kind of interrelatable. Um, they, they, they vary by role. So if you go in a machine learning uh, engineer job, MLOps type role, there is a very, very uh, kind of technical skills that you need. And there are certain domain knowledge stuff that you need, how CICD works, how things get deployed in production, things like that. However, if you go in the applied data scientist role, there is going to be another set of things that you need to understand how generic models are, how do you apply data to it to get to the output that you need, uh, and then so and so forth. So data analysts, the uh, business analysts, BI engineers, all of these data roles have their own kind of niche things and good to have things and must have things. And then there are other skills that you can get and we can maybe spend hours on it to just go through each one uh, but uh, please post your questions specific to that and we'll be happy to uh, get in those details yeah uh, really quick uh, guys so uh, there's a nice balance right between i think maybe the some of the questions we had posed which i think are good but then there's also i see a decent amount of questions in the chat uh to, for everyone here uh, there's a nice little upvote feature i believe so for the questions that are really important if you could help us just bubble it to the top and you know i think uh, the four of us we could just talk amongst ourselves or kind of just figure out which question seems to be the most burning does that sound good to everyone awesome uh so on that note uh what do you guys think about this there's a question here from aiden uh will people have a hard time finding their first data science job with all the tech layoff going on so I'd love to tackle that one because I know Aiden in real life. We got to wow. meet last year at a book signing that I did for the book. So that was really cool. And Aiden himself gave me a book. So shout out Aiden for being here. Shout out Aiden for the question. But uh, I have a really like s silly answer, which is like get a time machine and like fix the macro economy or go back in time. But sans that, unless you can fix the macro economy or unless you can go back in time and make the hiring, you know, go job hunt in 2021 when the market was hot, I don't know how much my job strategy really changes, you know, like it's, mm -hmm. it's always been hard to get your first job in data. It's even harder now, but I don't think that changes the like raw ingredients of what we need to do in terms mm -hmm. of networking, building portfolio projects, fixing your resume in terms of building hard skills. I don't think the layoff scene has really changed anything besides we just it's going to take longer and you have to apply to more companies but i don't i don't know if anything mechanically has changed what do you what do you all think i, I think one thing that maybe i offer a little bit perspective uh versus you guys because you guys have all worked for cool companies and i've only worked for lame not tech companies right uh is really the layoffs have been mostly in tech for example, I worked in oil and gas and chemical engineering, right? They've never been better. They're hiring like crazy right now for data analysts and data <laughs> okay. scientists because gas good. is still up. So even like, I do think like the Googles, the Microsofts, like the, we hear the Facebooks, we hear about their layoffs way more than when we hear about the rest of like the world. And although mm -hmm. tech is a huge part of data, it's only one little part. So for me, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think it matters as much as people might think it does. I see. Uh, now, I can share a personal perspective. So when I came to the U.S. in my first job in the U.S., uh, it was right after the recession of 2009, eight, uh, eight or nine time frame. So it was way worse than what it is right now. In general, there were no companies who were hiring for, for first time as an immigrant to get a job. It mm. was really, really, really hard. Um, I, I can I can attest to it from my own uh, perspective. So the, the hope that I can offer there is that 
uh, time is the best kind of kind of healer in, in that sense it does it does happen um, so don't lose hope I, I know when you're applying like hundreds of jobs or 50s of 50 60 jobs and you're getting immediate rejects you are in that so don't give up that would be my top advice the second advice would be as as uh, nick is mentioning is is uh, the fundamentals that you need to do and get ready and uh, and keep keep working on it make a schedule for yourself 20 minutes 30 minutes practicing your uh, skills uh, sending out these uh, coffee chats meetings with folks sending cold messages all of that like all of the above uh, it's more needed than now uh, more needed now than than any other times right so uh, you're here and you're part of this session connect with us right connect with folks over here who can be that uh, that person that can be your possible connection in the future as well so there are many opportunities like that. It's um, good. Plus one. Uh, my only question is for Avery. So you're saying if I get laid off in tech, I go outside of tech and I should be okay, right? No. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I think I think you're fine. <laughs> okay. No, it's I say it tongue in cheek, but uh, thank you, Aiden, for the question. Appreciate it. Um, I'm seeing one. Uh, if you would be so, this is from. Um, so this is from Romans. Thank you for the question, Romans. Um, and it says, if you would be a recruiter for your own company, what kind of what, what kind of skills would you want to see in candidates, as well as what projects would you want to see in a candidate's portfolio? Nick, do you want to take this? Um, I guess it's harder to say because I work at a really small company. I mean, I'm the founder and CEO of Data Lemur. That's kind of work, what I work on. And mm -hmm. Data Lemur is like a SQL interview prep platform, mm -hmm. similar to maybe Leak Code or HackerRank, but I hope better for a few different reasons. But this doesn't need to be a big sales pitch. But going back to your answer of what I would look for if you're applying to be working in a data role at um, Data Lemur would be, look, like I'm a consumer product. So I want to see how someone's product sense is. And it's really hard to evaluate that on a piece of paper, but you having built good projects or having done really good EDA work, where are exploring a user funnel and trying to find bottlenecks and how you're fixing those bottlenecks. That's the kind of stuff I would want to see. So just to be more concrete, sure, I, it's great if you have Python or R or SQL. What I really want to see is a project where you use these technical skills to drive a business outcome, ideally something to do with improving a product experience or optimizing some kind of marketing metric. Mm -hmm. That's my biggest thing that I would need a data analyst help for right now. And that's kind of what I'd want to see. Um, but maybe my answer doesn't really generalize that well because I work at, you know, I'm self-employed working at a small company. Mazuma, I'm curious, what what do you think? Because, you know, Microsoft's much more bigger, much more general. What What do you see? Yeah, um, so I actually am part of like the university recruiting and a few other uh, forums. Wow. And as a hiring manager, um, uh, I've looked at like thousands of resumes, if not less. So few few top tips. So plus one, do everything what Nick said uh, that they are their must haves to kind of relate to projects. Uh, but from a person who is looking at your resume, imagine they're they're getting fifty other resumes who look exactly like that, right? So mm -hmm. there are a few ways to stand out. Projects is the projects or recent uh, experience or anything that you have done directed to that particular job is going to make you stand out. Uh, that's the topmost thing. I'll give you a very explicit example. Uh, I was looking at a resume uh, from somebody uh, recently and they had shown uh, from a LinkedIn profile perspective what they would improve from a data science perspective to make it better. And then they had examples of that and a link to go to GitHub to actually get more information about that project, right? Mm -hmm. So as a hiring manager for me, that makes the case really, really easy. If I'm trying to hire somebody who's doing something similar, not LinkedIn, but maybe something similar, it's really easy for me to have that conversation and like really say, we, we want this, we want to interview this person, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, there's there's the steps before it that you need to go through the resume, ATS and whatnot to get to that point. And, and also some referrals and other things can get you there faster. Uh, that's the process problem. But from a resume and skills perspective, what will make you stand out? What are the things that you know very well that you can apply from your experience uh, to your resume to make to to make your resume stand out. So think about those projects. So any uh, I've seen resumes where people have interest in sports. They have done amazing analysis about a particular Premier League or a World Cup or whatever, and they have mm -hmm. those projects listed there. Uh, the one thing I would say which should not be there is also there uh, is is 
a generic one, right? So uh, when you see these projects are very generic that you've taken something out of our generic data set and done what everybody else has done, uh, which is not so niche or cannot prove that this is something you bring unique to the table, it, it, it makes uh, just go for the hiring manager to move on, right? They would be like, okay, I've seen this project mm -hmm. 50 times before. So mm -hmm. uh, try to be that project focus and highlight what's unique about you. Mm -hmm. Masa, I actually had a question for you then. So during the evaluation of these projects, because you're getting so many submissions for these jobs, right? Uh, in, in, in what you've seen, or in, at least in your personal evaluation process, uh, is do hiring managers take the time or do recruiters take the time to go through uh, the projects and, and at least take a look? Or? Yeah, good hiring managers definitely do. If mm. you really want good, good folks in your team and the right culture, yeah. they do. I spend plenty of time in clicking on everybody's GitHub links, mm. going to those projects, uh, doing some research on my own uh, mm -hmm. for, for, for those folks before we do the initial screen. So uh, hiring man the, the recruiters actually do a previous step also to just go through the initial screen and whatnot. But from that point on, when it comes to hiring manager, uh, it's really, really important to have a good pipeline of folks that you bring into yeah. the full loop of interviews, right? So mm -hmm. a lot of time is spent in going through those resumes and mm -hmm. just ranking them and just going through the what these folks have done. When we were interviewing or was that, when I was interviewing candidates, we would have like these kind of crazy on-site days where you would come. Uh, I think maybe Microsoft does the same or the candidate would come on site or on Zoom and there would be like five or six modules and we'd focus one hour on each module. And so there'd be two interviewers per module um, and then you kind of have to work through it. But in terms of uh, at least at LinkedIn, maybe portfolio focus, I haven't had much interaction there. Now, granted, I was never a hiring manager. I'm not a manager. Um, so maybe the hiring manager themselves does look at the portfolio, but I, I felt like usually the interview process was more like, how did you do throughout the day? Yeah, I think what you're mentioning is through mm -hmm. the loop itself, right? So when you come to the loop, you will have the, the interviews, interviewers divided into many kind mm -hmm. of sections. So they would be mm -hmm. technical interview, they would be behavioral stuff, team yeah. fit, things like that. And then mostly if you're coming as a data scientist, data analyst, there would be a couple of interviews just focus on the, the work itself, mm -hmm. right? So technical skills, coding problems, things like that. Um, so, so that's, that's the, the actual screen or the interview part of it. Uh, and then, uh, in order to get to that point is where the portfolio and stuff like how to stand out. And especially uh, if you're applying to these companies where we get like hundreds of resumes per job per mm -hmm. day, uh, it's, it's important to, uh, to showcase yeah. those skills. Makes sense. So I yeah. think that's a pretty robust answer. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing this as a pretty upvoted, uh, question in the thread team and it's, the question is, how are these three different? There's data engineer, data scientist, and uh, data analyst. Wondering if anyone wants to take a crack at that. I, I can take a stab. For me, the to be honest, like I almost put data engineering off to the side in a lot of ways because it is it is quite different. For data engineers, you're creating infrastructure, pipelines, like you're you're creating the roadways for data to flow. Right. And then in data or I guess in, as a data analyst or data scientist, you're using that data to you know provide insights. So like we talked about earlier, like I think data analytics can be applied to any industry. You can have data in, uh, engineering in any industry, but it's going to look pretty similar. Um, in terms of data analytics, you're always trying to figure out how we can use this data to provide business insight. Like Jimmy said earlier, how can we solve a business problem with this data? And then in terms of the difference between a data scientist and a data analyst, a lot of it is a data scientist you know, does everything a data analyst can do, but focuses a little bit more on machine learning, predictive analytics, while data analysts focus more on reporting and descriptive analytics, what happened in the past. So it's almost like what direction you're facing. Uh, and with that, it's a little bit harder to do the predictive stuff a lot of the time. So it takes a little bit more practice and learning. But mm -hmm. for me, the data analyst, data scientist, pretty similar. Data engineer is kind of, kind of like the, the black sheep of the family or something like that. Can I get your thoughts on this, Nick, as well? Yeah, I think of data engineering. So in the past, I've been also a software engineer. So I, I think data engineering is much closer to software engineering. Mm -hmm. It just so happens that you're manipulating, I guess, moving data around. But I don't know, at some, set, at some level, the problem isn't about moving the data around. It's just like, how do we build systems, software mm -hmm. systems to move I guess you're moving data around, but the po point isn't that you're moving data. It could be moving monkeys. It could be moving sheep. It's just moving something around. And it's more about building software systems to handle this kind of transfer. So all those problems in data engineering are 
way more on the software engineering and system design side yeah. versus in the data science and data analyst world. The problems aren't always really on building systems. They're more about like, oh, we have this specific data set. How do we extract insights or it's messy or we have these problems or how yeah. do we predict something? So it's closer to the actual data versus data engineering. You, you're just moving some CSVs. That's not the hard part. The hard part's like orchestrating it all, I think. Mm. So obviously that's an oversimplification, but I don't know. I think I think my my perspective is the same. I think well, was about uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe with the four of us, you probably have the most experience pushing models to production. Um, personally, for me, I I don't have too much on that. I lean more towards the stat side, so experimentation. Uh, I sit definitely closer to the business because that's probably the side that I enjoy more. And I was I was talking to an ML engineer, machine learning engineer, which is uh, you, I guess you can say data scientist, but maybe they lean more towards the engineering side, more focused on pushing these models to production. Like for example, when you search on Google or um, let's say when you search on Google, right, and they offer this kind of automatic type ahead recommendation, right? So as you're typing, they're giving you recommendations. I mean, that's a machine learning model or a, uh, that, that someone has quote unquote pushed production, reads kind of what you type, and then based on what you type and then also maybe who you are or your past search history or what's other, what, what else is popular right now, it'll come up with some recommendations, right? I think the algorithm behind that is similar, but the, the part that, you know, I don't, I haven't spent as much time studying is how do you do that in like a, a millisecond or milliseconds at scale? Right, that's the piece that um, maybe Moazma can actually give me a little more insight into. <laughs> yeah, let's take that example and talk about all these different roles. So you will okay. hear all these different roles in different organizations and set different titles, different actual work. So yeah. let's take that example of Google. When you're typing, you're seeing something. So sure. that is actually a model that's running. So somebody actually wrote that model. So an ML engineer uh, or a data scientist actually use an existing model to put it uh, to the stage where it's ready for production, right? Mm. So in, in in let's take a few steps back. So when somebody came up with this idea, you needed some data, you needed that data to be in certain form or shape, and mm. you needed to identify what sources the data is coming from to start the model. So you basically go to your BI teams, or mm. data engineering team to gather that. If you don't have that in a startup, maybe it's the same person doing wearing all those hats. So data engineers' primary job is to kind of build those data pipelines mm -hmm. and then do the system engineering around it like the uh, distributed processing and systems like that right now that's that's their role and we can go into more details what what that means in in a large scale now from that point onwards now the data is in decent shape it's not super clean data scientists spend a lot of time cleaning data and making making uh, making it ready for that there's the data scientists will come and try to build that value and try different type of models to figure out what is the right model to fit into this language processing that, that you need, right? The business problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, they will build that, they will try that, they will test it, they will train it, they will see the accuracy of the model and all of that. Now, when they're decently ready for it, they will move on to another team, which probably is the same team or a separate one, which is to package that model into production. So it's usually called the ML off side of things. Yeah. So the package CS thing again, Many tools, many, many things that, that are used today in the industry, but they will package it and then they will put it into the pipeline of the front end. So in this case, there's a front end application that, that you're typing that, right? That is owned by probably some other team. Um, now that's, that's happening uh, and they will apply that model on the edge, which is in this case, the, uh, the browser on which you need it. The, the whole processing and packaging it needs to be light enough. It needs to be very, very uh, fast or latency needs to be low. So all of that needs to be tested by, uh, by the MLOps team, right? So ML engineers and MLOps kind of work very closely on that. Now, where does data analysts come into picture? So when all of this is done and your, your, your product is being used by thousands of customers, now business wants to come in and they want to add another value or understand what our customers are seeing, how this adding any value. Can we add a prompt there to sell something? Now they go to the business team, business analyst, data analyst will actually look at all the telemetry that is coming through, how many users are coming through, and they will provide some insight back to the business. Uh, they might build some dashboards, things like that. So taking that example, I hope that kind of clarifies again, oversimplifying it, different teams have a different way, but these are how I look at these four or five different roles where you can take an idea to actual production and really get insights into business to add to upsell something at uh, in the future by using some data and some business analyst work as well. Yeah, I see. So if I had to kind of uh, abstract a little bit. It sounds like kind of the, the data, enge data engineering and the foundational work, right, is kind of always underlying throughout that process. But it sounds like kind of insights, analysis to understand maybe what users want or need, 
then work with ML ops or something to kind of, or maybe one of these more productionalizing teams to push it, uh, push this product out. Um, product goes out to thousands of users, right? And then business wants to, one, understand how it's doing, but two, also maybe potentially improve. And that's where the data analyst comes kind of back into the picture, right? Oh, whew, pass the test. Okay, that's good. Um, so I think that was good. I, I see this question is getting quite up, uh, upvoted. It seems we're focusing a little bit more on the ML side, but the question from is Uruj. I'm saying that right, hopefully. Um, thank you for the question. And the question is, what is the roadmap to be an ML, uh, a machine learning engineer, I would assume? with an MA in economics background. So maybe from econ to ML engineering. I can try to start uh, with that. I think my background was in finance. I studied finance, started my career in uh, finance as a financial analyst at uh, Symantec, uh, and then came to LinkedIn to work in HR and then eventually moved to data science. So I guess kind of <laughs> econish, right? Um, I think if you're starting in econ, my two cents would be to gradually grow your uh, I think you're analytically minded if you have that master's in econ already, right? So you kind of have the analytical foundation, right? Um, my overall recommendation or my opinion would be to take kind of like a, a gradual curve into the ML uh, engineer path, right? So I would maybe start trying to push towards like uh, some sort of analyst role, maybe data analyst, business analyst, right? Uh, pick up the 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 data wrangling skills, right? Be able to pull and, and wrestle data with SQL, right? Uh, I hear da Data Lemur is a pretty awesome website for that. Um, <laughs> uh, once you're able to query data, also learn how to analyze it. So with Econ, usually I think Stata or, or R are, are usually the popular tools from what I've heard, right? Um, so pick up these skills, be able to query data. Excel is great to start with as well, right? Um, learn how to analyze data, right? From query it, analyze it with either R, Stata, right? Present it, right? That'll be able to get you into sort of a data analytics uh, role, right? Or data analyst role. Now from there, I would say push, uh, push the analytics front, try to start doing a little bit of predictive analytics into your work, right? Start picking up the basic machine learning models, right? Uh, what's something, something called um, uh, supervised, unsupervised learning, right? Some of the basic machine learning models, know the trade-offs between the two, and then try to take that work and then apply it to, to enhance the work that you deliver as a data analyst, right? Uh, from there, you'll you'll start to push maybe into some of the more data science realm of things, right? Um, and then once you work as a data analyst slash data scientist, you'll be in that. If going back to Mozma's example of the product um, end to end lifecycle, right? You will work with some of those ML engineers, right? Um, either maybe understanding the models or helping to understand how their models are performing, right? At that point, if you can build good rapport with them, I'd say at that point, ask them, hey. Any openings on your team? I can take a shot at interviewing. I know you, you know me, I can pick up what you're learning, right? Um, and then eventually, like I said, just curve your way into that ML engineering uh, role. But that's uh, that's that's Jimmy's approach. <laughs> Definitely not the be all end all approach. And I'm interested to see what my fellow panelists uh, say about this. I, I'm going to be honest. I don't, I've never been an ML engineer, so I'm not going to answer it, but my answer would, would be very similar to Jimmy. Start smaller. <laughs> Get your yeah. foot in the door. That's what I would say. Yeah. It's a good answer. Uh, very succinct way to, to summarize my long-winded answer. Yeah, you nailed it. I think it's, that's the right path to start. Hmm. And talk to more people who have done this, something similar um, or, or anything related so they can give you their insights also. I see. Okay, hey, we're going to move on to this question from, well, uh, Kritika. Thank you for asking. Um, what is your take on how data science careers will evolve with advancements in LLM and generative AI space, right? I would love to take a stab at this because, sure. um, as mentioned, Data Lemur has a whole bunch of real SQL interview questions from companies. So someone ran them through ChatGPT and... Whoa. ChatGPT is actually able to solve the SQL interview questions that are actually asked at real companies. Now, sometimes, actually enough of the time, the query is like slightly off, mm. but what the ChatGPT output gives you is like 80 to 90% of the way to the correct solution, right? Wow. And that's kind of insane because these are all real screening questions for real companies. And now ChatGPT can write the SQL for you 80 to 90% of the way. So AI is coming, like it's not like uh, vaporware, like it's actually getting really close. And I think that the trick is to realize how to like, the only way to last is to embrace it 
and use it to kind of improve your productivity. So rather than try to fight it, like, you know, it's here, it's coming. The bigger thing is, okay, well, what does ChatGPT not do well? It doesn't well do well in translating an ambiguous problem into the SQL code. If you already know, hey, I have these tables, these columns, and I want to do a seven-day rolling average on this column, it can exactly do that for you. Mm. But knowing that, oh, this vague business question could be solved by finding a rolling seven-day average of the sales for you know this department, that's kind of where the human still has to do its work because that requires having a lot of business contacts and having a lot of knowledge about what are the underlying tables and columns and what's actually important. So what it really means is what I like to think about it is, okay, the parts where, you know, the parts about actually writing the SQL code or writing a Python code snippet, they might be taking over, but the real hard part of all this stuff is translating the business context into what actually needs to be done in the code um, and like figuring out what, what needs to be done. And that part, I don't think, ChatGPT or any of these large language models are going to come after for a good while of time. So if you get really good at talking to business stakeholders and you get really good at like building domain experience so that you know what the right tables and the right columns are to look at, mm-hmm. you know, it might be okay if your SQL skills aren't the sharpest. So that's how I like to think about it and go future proof. I want to hear y'all takes. I-, I like to think about like, what if we were transported today Back to 1985, and we're on the same panel. I guess we're not on Zoom. I don't know what we're on, but but they're like, hey, there's this thing called Microsoft Excel coming, and it's going to take all of our statistician jobs. You know, like I, I really just think at the end of the day, it's a new tool for people like us to use, and I don't think it's going to replace it replace us in any way if anything we get to do like more high level work and high level thoughts because like obviously we've gone through microsoft excel and there's still room to analyze data right and obviously this is a little bit maybe more um remarkable than microsoft excel but it's just it's just a tool that all of us will end up using to do data tasks so like nick said we still need human elements to it at least at least right now we'll come back to me in like 15 years we'll see yeah, huge plus one to what both of you said. I would also add one small thing that the folks who are building this also need data scientists, machine learners, and engineers and all of that. So you have jobs there also. Uh, and then there's the business application of light science of uh, these generative AI or these models as well. So they're both sides of the things. So you still need a lot of people like you in the data sp- field. Uh, my prediction, and I might be wrong in a few years, every field is going to be data field in the next few years uh, because AI is penetrating into every product, especially tech products. Um, and then the more data savvy you get, the more understanding of these things you get, um, you you will have an edge on a lot of folks in the next few years. So learn about these, connect with real examples and, and go from there. I'll give a plus two to everything. Usually give, people give plus one, I'm gonna give a plus two because yeah. I, I pretty much agree uh, with what, what everyone has said. Um, thank you for your question, I appreciate it. Um, this one is from Saad. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is actually for you, Nick. Uh, I want to ask Nick or anyone uh, interested in geospatial. Is there a future with it? And what are the best applications for it? Uh, what are your tips for entering this field? Uh, thank you, Evan, for your time. Thank you for your time, Saad. Um, yes. I think geospatial is a good field as long as we don't end up living in the metaverse and then it doesn't matter where we are <laughs> geospatially. But as long as we still live on Earth and we're moving around, geospatial will still be a good field. Learn the Esri product suite pretty well. Um, I know those right. tools are very expensive um, and usually given out to governments and stuff like that. So there's open source equivalents like um, Hugis. So learn one of those. Mm. But what I want to emphasize, at least in geospatial, is first, the technical skills um, that you use, honestly, like how you analyze data, geospatial data is a lot like how you analyze healthcare data or HR data or any other fields mm. of data. So mm-hmm. first focus on being a great data analyst or data scientist, and then worry about the geospatial aspects or the specifics tools and softwares. Because um, where I worked at uh, SafeGraph, very few of us were geospatial experts. We were all good data experts. And then yeah. of course, on the job, we got to learn some of the geospatial intricacies but it's not that as deep. Um, so that's the other thing. And the last part is domain experience really matters in these in the geospatial industry because a lot of the applications are in like oil and gas 
and you can't just i mean i'm sure avery can talk about it but basically my my opinion of it is okay within the subfields that are using these kind of geospatial tools you'll have like people who are like 30 year experts in like meteorology or like water sheds or like you know oil and gas or minerals right so that's a world i don't know too much about because we're still doing something slightly different but um yeah i mean just if you're entering it i wouldn't worry about those things I'd just be worried about the generalist data science data analyst work i see so i actually have a naive question me being a i live in an ignorant rock what is geospatial it sounds like space and yeah uh, geo <laughs> so it's it's a lot about visualizing uh, so like mapping so like data okay. about the physical earth um so wow. like watersheds or how people move or like where are things located so like real estate industry is doing this stuff agriculture mm -hmm. oil and gas forestry those kind of fields that's awesome need to that's know cool. where things are where forests are how are the crops looking what's the square footage what's the elevation um if we you know i mean maybe avery you want to talk about this because you probably know something from the oil and gas world because they're a big user of geospatial analytics yeah, I was mostly in what's called the downstream. So I was like in refining. So we didn't actually use it very much. It's mostly the upstream, people getting oil out of the earth. But like uh, satellites, governments, they're really into that stuff too. So, mm -hmm. Right. A big intelligence aspect to it as well. Because um, they're always, yeah, satellite data and satellite imagery and remote sensing are big things. So, yeah. Yeah. But, One other interesting. Yeah, go for it. Well, one of the industry where I've seen the use cases is climate uh, change and all of that. So a lot of folks are looking at that across different regions to understand how over the years this has changed with glaciers and all of that. And a lot of work done by the UN is in that space. So if you're looking for a project for good, uh, they have listed on the UN website some of these projects that need geospatial uh, skills to analyze this data, satellite data. And Mary in the Q&A says public health. That's also a field that uses this stuff a lot. So it's it's everywhere. So I, you know, it's everywhere. So it's a good field. That's pretty cool. I learned something new today. I had no idea. Uh, being a classic techie, right? This heads down this computer, right? No, no sense of the outside world, right? But that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, and thank you, Sam, for the question. Uh, this one is from uh, Romans. Thank you for asking. Um, uh, given that you suggest applicant to have some kind of portfolio, what would stand out uh, more? Uh, good pet projects without salt. Whoa. Uh, what would stand out more? Uh, good pet projects without solid work experience, uh, gaps or non-related experience, or solid five to seven years of experience uh, from a big company like Accenture, Google, Meta without any projects. Um, I think I think I understand. Like it's like go ahead, Avery. Yeah, it, like. If you, yeah, if you don't have any solid work experience, but you have good pet projects versus mm. having like good work experience. And I'm like the biggest advocate for projects of all time. I did 30 data science projects in 30 days in my YouTube. So like, oh. I love projects, but I'm sorry, you can't beat five to seven years at Accenture, Google, <laughs> or Meta. It's very hard to make enough good projects where that would probably be better than five to seven year experience. I will say that in Nick's book, he does talk about a pretty cool uh, project that he made that helped let him mm -hmm. land some pretty cool jobs but it's a it's in my opinion nick it's less of a project and it was like a business for you at the time so <laughs> yeah like it's 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 possible but it's really hard if i were telling you i'd probably just say take the job at google meta or accenture oh 100 percent. and and to be clear so that's chapter three in the book uh how to build a kick-ass portfolio project that's the name of the chapter because i'm a huge proponent as well i didn't make 30 of them like avery and his youtube channel definitely check it out it's actually like 30 good projects so it's, wow. it's a lot of effort was put into it a big major props there but um yeah i yeah, know i i i, I want to caveat like i had a big portfolio project but this was still when i was an undergrad right and mm. the big emphasis here is if you're from coming from a non-traditional background or if you haven't done internships or this is your first or second job that's where the projects matter. If you already have seven years of being a data scientist at Meta, then it doesn't really matter. You can talk about seven years worth of work. Um, but I don't know how many people in the audience today have seven years of data science experience. I mean, I don't have seven years of data science experience. Uh, so, <laughs> you know. I see. Well, wow, plus one to both of you guys. I mean, that's that's very impressive, right? I learned something new again. And, and Nick, for the, the kick-ass chapter, I'll definitely have to check it out. Um, I think the one thing that I, I do like about... Sure, okay, seven years... 
experience Google, tough to beat, right? But I think the one thing that I respect um, from the project aspect is the initiative, the willingness to learn, right? The willingness to put yourself out there and to try something new and to, to fail, you know, proudly and spectacularly, right? Um, that, I guess my definitely not as uh, valiant effort on that was trying to do these data science certificates online from these MMOs, MOOCs, these online courses, uh, when I was still in HR. Um, and when I would go to these interviews uh, for the data analyst roles, I was again, in HR and trying to interview outside. Um, the first and uh, the first thing people would always bring up is, wow, you know, you have 10 certificates from these uh, boot camp things, right? Um, and it, they were more impressed and it definitely shined it put me in a positive light in a sense that, hey, this was a person that was willing to learn, willing to do, go beyond to learn these skills. And it shows your passion, your zeal for um, for data, right? For, for, for trying to push into this field. And so granted, yes, the experience does matter, but also I think that aspect of like showing that you want it is also an influencing factor in whether you get that first job or not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Romans, thank you for the question. So this one is from Maposa. Thank you for your time, Maposa. Um, this is, a, I think, a classic one. What are the hard skills required to make it as an entry-level data scientist or data engineer? Uh, on, a scale of, on a scale of one to what is the required level? Okay, yeah, basically, you know, what are the top three or four hard, hard skills and maybe, and maybe on a scale of like one to 10, how important are they, right? Yeah, I can... I can get started on this. So uh, data science wise, right? So one of the programming languages, so, so again, we've talked about the business domain and things mm -hmm. like that. You need to understand how to apply it, but to really, in terms of hard scale, uh, one of the programming languages uh, that, that is really, really used is Python. Uh, so if you have that, that's definitely top, top most in my perspective. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you have to understand where the data lands and how to curate. So SQL skills, uh, mm -hmm. I work in the SQL team. So really build the next level of SQL functions. Uh, wow. SQL skills are really, really important. Uh, and, and, and I've been hearing for many, many years that, that it might be replaced or changed or whatever, but no, every data scientist, data analyst, that data engineer that I've worked in my career for the past 15 plus years have, have, have to have that. So definitely that's one skill. Uh, and, and, and then th these would be my top two, but then there are additional skills that you can get to. If you go to data engineering side, there is Scala or a Spark or those side of things that you can, you can learn about big data and how data is stored. Uh, but, but those would be my top two and I'll, I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. I had actually, actually had a question uh, for you, Masma, for those more uh, esoteric or, you know, uh, special skills like Scala and Spark. I guess at least what I've seen in the, in the interviews that I've gone through, most of the times it's kind of company dependent, depending on what uh, system or infrastructure they have set up. But the universal language that I've seen in every interview is SQL, right? Do you see, yeah. does everyone, <laughs> Nick's like, yes, data lever. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, so SQL, then you definitely, for one of the technical interviews, there would be a SQL interview mm -hmm. there. And then uh, if you're going for data science job, there would be a model building engineer problem mm -hmm. solving. So they might give you a problem. Like, for example, if you have, if you own, I'll give you an example here. They might ask you if you're Uber Eats, you want to add a Korean mm -hmm. food category into it and tell me what models you will use or what, and you have to d design the whole thing, right? So uh, thinking about that, there's, of course, the communication skills, all of that, but then you need to understand how we do build the model, what types of models are out there, how do you gather the data, what results mm -hmm. you will do, how do you improve the model, the whole life cycle of mm -hmm. a model designed for data scientists. Mm -hmm. And then in the in the inter interview itself, most of these uh, companies will let you choose your choice, uh, programming language choice. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of time what I've seen is people use Python. It's easy uh, to do that. And, and you can do a lot of things uh, done and mm -hmm. very fast. So uh, I would go with that. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing SQL and I'm hearing Python, right, guys? This is what the, the two that... Um, uh, to staying true to to Mopos's question, on a scale of maybe one to ten, where where do you guys think this would rank? Uh, like, if you had to scale it, like which one is, or, or maybe they're both tens, or one is an eight, another is a seven, or Nick, you can't say sequels a ten. Uh, that's what I'm gonna say. <laughs> it's, it's it's not a ten. It's not a ten. Yeah. It's, oh, it's I I I I. It's not a ten. It's just that like, if your Python is weak, or if you're if you if you have a CS background go deep into Python. Like I come from a CS mm. background. It was, you know, I, I did Python for so many years before I even did data science because I'd been coding for a while in Python without knowing anything about data science. But if you're coming into the data world and you don't come from a programming background, 
but you want to date a job. I feel like SQL is a little bit easier to learn and like much closer to like actually doing the things. You feel like SQL is a 10. I think that's what you were trying to say, right? <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a 10 if you're not a great coder or you haven't done multiple CS classes. It's, it's a 10. I see. Um, yeah. I, I agree. I'm just I'm just giving you a hard. Okay, a hard cool, time. cool, cool. Um, what one thing I will say is it also depends on what role you want, right? Because like for instance, if you're going to be like a data analyst, like that's your first role, like mm. you might try something like Tableau, which is a little bit easier to learn. It's a little mm. bit of an easier, more gradual learning curve. You know, SQL's SQL's not too bad either, especially compared to Python. But you know, Tableau is even easier because you're not really coding for most of it. So, and you know, you could a lot of you guys could land a really great job by just using Tableau. You know, it could be decently high paying, decently remote, those types of things. So, really, just depends on what your goals are and what type of what type of job you're looking at. Oh yeah, T Tableau mixed in with a little bit of Excel can 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 get you places um, mm -hmm. and isn't as daunting to learn mm -hmm. as some of these things like Python. You know. Actually, on that note, uh, Nick, I wanted to get your thoughts. So if I'm new at SQL, would it help to learn Excel first, uh, just to kind of visualize how things work out and then? Yes, but I, okay, I might be biased. I feel like a lot of folks have already seen SQL or Google Sheets. Mm. If you kind of know the basics of that, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to go crazy. I think if you can build some pivot tables, and you know, do some quick lookups and do some basic visualization and charting. I think after that, you're good to go. So, um, but again, I totally understand that my background. I, I'm curious, like most, do most high schools teach Excel or like most college majors? No. What about most college? See, yeah, I had a weird background, but what about most college degrees? I feel like most econ or finance or at least engineering, there had to be somewhere Excel. Or <sighs> Okay, so I'll try that. So for finance, I think Excel was definitely used, but it was so several things that it, it there was first of all, there was never like a direct class where they taught you all the functions in Excel, right? That's number one. It was always kind of just used. And when it was used, it was used in, I think maybe a more basic sense. You were just summing things, averaging things, maybe a lookup here or there, a V lookup here or there, right? Who uses like well, who look up, right? Um, but um the so in that sense, it was kind of limiting because I think, especially at undergrad, at least from in my experience in the finance program, uh, there was never really a case where you're pushing up against the limit of what Excel could handle from a data perspective, right? Data volume is another issue that I found um, when working with Excel, right? After about, I mean, I know there's 1,064,000 rows in an XLSX file, but in reality, like it starts to crash at around, I don't know, 50, 100,000 starts to kind of slow down, especially if you're running some sort of function. Um, so that is also something that, at least, I mean, given the volume of data that I, that I work with, I something that I didn't have to learn, or I didn't learn how to do in undergrad, and I didn't have to try to learn how to do until I actually faced the issue in industry. Yeah, so those two uh, factors. Yeah. But but I do like Excel. Like if Excel, if all these things are new to you and you're not really sure what we're yeah. talking about with pivot tables, start there. Mm -hmm. I just dropped a link to a book called Advancing into Analytics. Mm. I find it quite good because that book is about teaching you about data analytics, but they start with Excel. And then later on, they show you R and Python, and they try to map what you already learned in Excel to Python and R, right? So it's like, hey, now that we have this common understanding of how to do data analysis in Excel, look at how it kind of maps to Python and R. So I like that because I know it's quite daunting to learn a programming language, especially if you're learning it from like a programmer's perspective, which mm -hmm. is not about data analysis, but here they're trying to teach it to you as if this is just a glorified Excel that's more powerful. Mm. And I think that's kind of interesting as a way to learn these things if you're good at Excel or you know you want a data analyst job. So mm. I think that book could be interesting to folks who yeah. find Python and R too daunting and you know want to just start with Excel and SQL. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know that could be a good book. The plus one to that, Nick, I think. The, the mapping of Excel, so because I started in finance, so I started with Excel, right? The mapping of finance of like SQL and then how like a lookup is similar to a left join, right? Um, that definitely is something that uh, I was like, whoa, this is crazy. There is a mapping, right? Right. Um, and and your pivot tables are group buys in SQL, right? And yeah, like, right. Oh, you know, <laughs> yeah. so if you're yeah. already used to making pivot tables all the time, then you're like, oh, okay, this is not too bad. Yeah, I see. That's fair. Um, so, uh, there, so the next question on the list is actually kind of similar. So let's continue this, but so there, we, we see, and this is from Bernard. He's asking, what are the typical baseline knowledge, skills, and abilities companies look for, for in hiring roles in, in data science? Right. And we talked about SQL and we talked about Python. 
Um, what are you guys' take on like maybe the stats ML kind of side of things? Yeah, so I can take that. So from data science perspective, again, understanding the data science, so there are applied data scientists, there's the research data scientist mm -hmm. and the ML engineering side of things. So again, try to figure out which one are you looking at. Data science mm -hmm. is to me a very generic uh, thing. Uh, in, in that area of uh, if you're looking at particular applied data scientists uh, who might not be building a model from scratch, they might be using an existing model and applying the data or the particular problem from your company or your team. And then solving that would be just using Python or R, one of those languages. Mm -hmm. uh, they would be understanding having really good communication skills to get the data, gather the data, they would be spending a lot of time in cleaning the data. So they would be spending a lot of time in uh, kind of these Python libraries to clean the data, remove uh, uh, duplicate values, null values, whatever those things are. Um, they will spend a lot of time in the investigation phase. And then you'll start applying uh, existing uh, Python libraries to, to build the model and, and, and run, run your data through it. You will take a subset, sample the data, run through it train the model, see the results, accuracy, some other metrics, and then and mm -hmm. keep on improving that. So that would be what your life cycle would look like as a data scientist team, uh, as a data scientist in our team, uh, mm -hmm. which is doing that. Uh, your knowledge and skills, we already talked about programming language equal these things. Um, the other one area that we did not talk about is how do you make the data story, right? So as a data scientist, you need to sell your model to your in, to your leader, to your team, like why we are using it. So there's, there's I think there was a session either today or tomorrow in this conference itself about data storytelling. I don't know if it already happened or uh, it's supposed to happen later. Definitely attend that. Uh, there are many, many great courses on that. So to me, a good data scientist is a good data storyteller. They can actually take the data and tell the story about that data right? Mm -hmm. And use data science techniques to solve that problem, the business problem that you're doing. So those are kind of the soft skill side of things, but having a good data story of why you want to do it, start with the why, and then how and what tools are needed to solve that problem is going to be the magic to be a successful data scientist in a team. Uh, I definitely agree with that. I think I can add a little perspective, definitely on the applied side, which definitely is more my experience. I'm definitely not on the research side, uh, but plus one to what Mosma uh, said, um, there is, I think, at least uh, the company is, that I looked at, a pretty uh, direct emphasis on a lot of hypothesis testing. So you guys may have heard of the term A-B testing, right? When you're testing a new feature versus an old feature, whether that's a UI change or a model change on a website, right? Uh, really understanding the the crux of the you know the, the stati statistics behind it, which is really just hypothesis testing 101, right? What is the p-value, right? Why is it 0.05, right? Um, what does it mean to be statistically significant? Uh, the difference between practical versus statistical significance, and then how do you guide the business based on um, the results of those experiments? Um, at least um, in the interviews that I've gone through, that like, there was a lot of focus on that. But again, this is definitely more on the applied side. Um, I have no experience on the research side, so I can't comment as much um, on that. But I, I suspect that a lot of the folks in the audience here uh, may want to push into the applied side first before deciding if they want to move into the, uh, the more research heavy side. Uh, Sela Cho, uh, thank you for your question, Sela. Um, is there a need for leaders in the data science AI business space, AI, data science slash AI slash business space, who may not be as technically qualified? Yes, um, I can take this. So uh, this is a question that I get a lot uh, as a leader in the space. Uh, there, there are people that I've seen at uh, my level and my my leadership as well that might not come from a typical technical background. Uh, but they are the ones who either have the domain knowledge or uh, a lot of these other skills uh, that are needed to be successful for any team. So there are a lot of people skills and process skills that are outside of the technical skills uh, that are not directly related. If you have all of this, then then that's amazing, right? If you come from a technical background and over the time, over, over the years, you, you get to it. One thing I do uh, say that to a lot of my mentees and people that I talk to is, uh, what I mentioned in the previous answer, the why, right? So the business problem that you're trying to solve, uh, you can solve, you can write the best code uh, possible, if, but if it's not selling somebody and there's no customer out there and nobody buying that, then there's there's no value you're adding to the business or the team that you're working on. So it's very important to understand that. And the early in your career, you start understanding that uh, it takes you a long way. So starting with the why and what impact your model or your work makes to the business, it makes you go 
go a long way. And that's what I, I see as good leaders do. They provide that clarity and ambiguity why we're doing this. Um, so you could be, come from a technical background to do that, but you don't need technical background uh, to, to be doing that, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are other ways to do that. Having, like I think previous questions Nick mentioned, product sense, uh, understanding how products work, how customers interact with products. There are a lot of technical skills that you can gain, but to be a leader, um, I truly believe they don't need have to have always the technical skills. It's a plus if you are in a technical team uh, and, and you understand, uh, but it's not a must have from my perspective. Just one of that. Okay. Um, just a quick time check. I know we're at the bottom of the hour plus three minutes. Um, I think panelists, I think everyone may be taken until say 145, we'll call it, because uh, yeah. I think that was the, the time. All right, great, fantastic. Um, this next question is from Mohammed. Uh, thank you for your question, Mohammed. Um, how does one prepare uh, to crack the coding interviews at main companies? I think those are the Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, uh, for the data scientist role. I could start. Uh, so I'm not really main. I'm part of. Once upon a time, they used to call it Flag. There was a LinkedIn in there, but <laughs> I think Microsoft bought us out and we kind of disappeared. Thanks, Mazma. Um, tell us about the The M stands for Meta. I don't think it's oh, for Microsoft. It's not just one. <laughs> what? One it used to be Fang before. <laughs> that, that's that's uh, so that's that's Nick's, Nick's M there, right there, Meta, right? So I guess at LinkedIn, I, I'll talk a little bit more about the 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 on-site loop, right? Um, and so we touched on some of the skills that are really important, right? Number one, first and foremost, is SQL, right? Uh, second is Python. Uh, R is also there, right? I, I come from an R background because of my stats. So, so one language to kind of query data, one language to kind of code, slice and dice, uh, analyze data, so R, Python, right? Um, there is uh, a decent emphasis, at least from what I've seen on uh, stats, like I mentioned, A-B testing. Um, there may be also a question on maybe applied machine learning, right? These are kind of touching on some of the modules that, uh, that I think are important. Right. And then there's actually a very nebulous module called product sense, right? Where you're asked a very, and I think this is the hardest one because this is one that you can't really study for. Um, usually you have like an hour to maybe answer one or two questions. And it's very like an ambiguous uh, business question, right? Either it's related to the product that you're interviewing, usually it's related to the, the company or the product that you're interviewing for, or maybe a more generic sort of case study question, right? I can give you an example. Like um, an example would be, um, I mean, maybe the CEO of a, of a Motel 6, you know, the, the motel company comes up to you and he says, hey, Jimmy, I want to open up a, a, a motel chain in Vietnam, right, for Motel 6. Should I do it or not? That's it, right? And so the idea there is that it's kind of this ambiguous question. And the, the good answers are, there's really no right answer per se, but, but the good answers from what I've seen are from folks who can take an ambiguous problem and then frame it up, Right work with the interviewer to make some assumptions, right? And then from there, kind of quickly assess whether this investment or this feature, this product is worth taking or not, right? So kind of those five things, right? SQL, maybe some coding, stats, some applied machine learning, um, and a product sense question. Obviously one more interview for a culture fit, but that's more just uh, behavioral, maybe a lunch or something. Um, that's generally what I see at these uh, bigger tech companies, uh, but obviously that changes as well. So maybe, for other folks, what have you guys seen? I, I want to give a quick piece here. Um, Jimmy, you said you can't study for the nebulous product sense, mm. thing, except there's a little book that has a, hey. whole, <laughs> with a whole bunch of questions because you totally can. Um, and it sounds, oh, and Avery's repping it too. I love it. Oh, wow. Um, no, you totally can study. It, it's definitely hard. And I think one of the things I tell people for these technical interviews is like software engineering interviews, they're so regimented. You can grind lead code versus data interviews. They cover so much. You kind of get intimidated and you're like, oh, I can't even study, but I want to kind of dispel that. No, you can totally study for data science interviews. There are total common patterns. Like how Jimmy just asked, should I make this business decision? There are totally frameworks you can keep reusing regardless of the question. I'll give you an example. The first thing you want to do is always clarify, hey, Oh, when do you want to launch this in Vietnam? Oh, how many hotels? Is this the normal Motel 6 or is this some boutique brand? Second thing I do always is um, try to align my answers to the company and the product. Oh, Motel 6 is all about efficiency or it's all about serving like price sensitive customers on the bottom end. It's not like a boutique hotel. Oh, okay, based on these you know assumptions and like what I know about Motel 6, here's my answers, right? And the third big thing is always mention trade-offs. Hey, I do think we should build motels in Vietnam, but I do recognize 
X, Y, and Z assumptions would need to be checked later, or X, Y, and Z things could go wrong. So it always try to balance the risk because even if I say we should build it, here are the three things that also make sure to check. Otherwise, my answer will have to be no, right? So that kind of framework, there are, there are totally frameworks for these kind of questions, and they're totally really common things that keep coming up. Um, so this is not just for product sense. This is just in general, like stats, SQL coding, they're common patterns. And if you just solve enough problems through a book like mine or just online or through data lemur or whatever, you just solve enough problems, you'll start to see common patterns and it becomes a lot more tractable of a problem to study. Makes sense. I was just trying to drive book sales. Like I got you. No, 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 no. <laughs> I got you. No, but oh, it makes good. sense, right? Because it it's like how 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 you know it's so hard to have a correct answer, but once you realize they're not looking for a correct answer, they're looking for a mm. thought process. And there is a set way to think about these kind of open-ended problems to drive results, then it becomes a lot more doable. Yeah. Uh, what, maybe one or two more questions then. Uh, <laughs> yeah, from Mary, is chat GPT clearing FANG interviews? I think you said 80, 90% of the way there, right? Nick? Yeah, yeah, exactly. There'd be like some small things. Of course, we had to do some work into like prompting it correctly. Like you right. had to kind of give it a good explanation of like what it should do. Mm -hmm. That's that human part I was alluding to earlier about explaining the business concept and translating mm -hmm. it into a good prompt. That's, you know, that's what we have to do. But um, the actual SQL query can spit out window functions. Very cool. I think I'll take one more here. So um, from Kashif, thank you for your question, Kashif. Um, what is a good learning pathway for professionals without a software engineering background to become credible in data or ML? Uh, I Kashif understands that master's is not uh, required. So if I understand correctly, you're saying without software engineering background, but you mm -hmm. are already professional, right? So you're already in the field doing something. I'll try to answer from that perspective. Yeah. Uh, I I think there are a few approaches, right? So the first approach is that within the company or place where you are, you try to find the data-oriented teams and connect with them, understand what they're building and see what are your transferable skills, right? So whatever field you're in today, you have certain skills. List it down, take a paper and pen, write down what those skills are. What do you know well? Uh, what, what are the areas and skills that you can improve? And then understanding from the gap what needs to be in that team. So all the skills we talked about, SQL, R, Python, other skills, just, just understand from that team perspective, if it's more data analyst, business analyst side of things, they might be using Tableau, Power BI, they might be using some other like uh, Google Analytics, things like that. Just, just understand that. From that point to this point, now you know the delta, right? So delta is a term we use in data engineering a lot, like what's today and what's like tomorrow. Figure out a step-by-step -step process to get there and skills to learn. There are many, many, many courses out there. There are uh, like many folks who, are, who have many credible for, uh, courses there. My recommendation would be to go in a boot camp or, or a, a peer programming kind of space where you have other folks in the same cohort, uh, cohort-based learning, data science, Tojo is a great place uh, where we are here today to, to get some of those courses. Uh, you can learn uh, the foundations of that and then apply it using the projects that we mentioned earlier in this call. Mm -hmm. So build some projects, put them on your portfolio, network, connect with those internal teams and get, get to that. That would be my advice if I had to start today and I'm not coming from a software engineering background. Yeah, I think you nailed that. That was a great answer. I have picked out a couple of questions and I think this first one how do you define an approach to a data science project when you're in the interview? Interesting. So when you're in the interview, well, I think interviews can be very stressful, scary situations, even with Nick's book, they are not very fun, right? And uh, it's just it's just everyone gets nervous in an interview, right? And so one of the things that I like to try to tell people that want to break in, tell my students uh, is... How can we make this interview more comfortable for you? And I think one of the ways is to talk about stuff that you like, talk about stuff that you're comfortable with, talk about stuff that you're familiar with, right? Because you don't really love the element of surprise. So I always try to, you know, tell people, tell my students to, if you can like do a project that's very similar to what they might do at that place, that's going to be like really impressive. So like, for instance, if you're interviewing at LinkedIn, like that, that example earlier uh, that was shared about like, oh, like do like a LinkedIn project if you're applying for LinkedIn or something like that, right? If you can give that to them in the interview. Now, like Jimmy said, LinkedIn kind of has uh, a very like, 
strict way they do the interview process. And a lot of the bigger tech companies are that way, but um, especially some of the smaller companies, they're not going to care as much. And you can kind of actually almost send them the project before you actually interview. And then I've noticed that when you do that, that actually puts a lot of the pressure off of the interviewer or off of you and you can just talk about your project. Those be like, oh, tell me about this. Tell me about that. So in my opinion, the best time for when it comes to project interviews is to do it long before you get into the interview and to send it to them beforehand and say, hey, I did this project. It's very similar to like what I might do inside of this role in the future. I thought you could take a look and let me know any thoughts. And that way, like they ask me questions about it. I don't really have to bring it up. And they're asking me less like, difficult stuff and stuff I care more about. So that's what I would say in terms of projects and interviews. And Nick, do you have anything that you want to add to that? No, I think Avery did a really good job about it. So good. Okay, perfect. And there is a question from Mary. There we go. Okay, so this will be all four of you. So I want an answer from everyone. Do you enjoy your work in data science and ML? And then, you know, what's the one thing that you really enjoy the most about it? And we'll start with Jimmy, since he's the closest to me here on. I think it's very intellectually stimulating. I think that's one thing that I enjoy. It's inherently very challenging, impactful. It forces you to stay on your toes, right? Um, you're not really doing the same thing every day. It's something different <laughs> every day. The one consistent thing I can say is that, yeah, you just have to always have a problem-solving mindset, right? Be okay with ambiguity. Kind of makes the job stressful at times, but it also makes it fun, right? At least specifically for me, the, the folks that I work with that uh, LinkedIn, I, I consider them really good data scientists, right? Top notch in their field and, you know, very well published and, but also just really fun human beings to hang out with and, and work with, right? So in those aspects, um, I enjoy for the job. Okay, great. Thanks, Jimmy. How about you, Masma? Yeah, I think I absolutely love it. Why? That's why I'm still here. Uh, so many years into it. Uh, my first job out of college was in data. I'm still here in the data field. I do want to plus one what Jimmy said. So over the years, you'll see different trends. Uh, so every three to five years uh, in my career, I've seen a newer thing kind of uh, come in, uh, be it the tool perspective or the way industry is shifting from traditional BI to big data to now then cloud computing to now the generative AI space. So these trends will come every three to five years on average, if not sooner. But yes, having that growth mindset, keep the learning that approach. To me, the thing that I enjoy the most is, is that learning, right? So I, I do think so many years into it as well, I'm learning something new. And when I'm not learning on my job is when it's time to switch jobs or think it's something else, right? So that, that to me is something that I look forward to every single day. The folks that you work with, if you have the right team and culture, then that's the icing on the top. Okay, Avery, you're up next. No, nah, just kidding. It's awesome. <laughs> like it's 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 really fun. I think there's a lot of good things about it. I think, you know, they pay the salaries are great and they like, you know, you have flexibility in your schedule and you can work remotely in a lot of situations. But I think for me, the biggest thing is like I actually feel like it's fun. I feel like I'm a data detective sneaking through the data, trying to figure things out and not get caught as uh, you know, I go along. And to me, that's worth so much because we're gonna spend so many hours, like tens of thousands of hours of our life working. And you got to do something you enjoy. Like life's way too short to spend time on stuff you don't love. So I definitely like it. I think it's a great career. Okay. Nick? Yeah. I like data, but actually slowly over time, I realized I like helping people more, which is kind of why I these days don't day to day do as much SQL mm -hmm. work and more so try to empower other people. Because as much as I like the data stuff, I, I think I figured out I'm, I wouldn't say it's a people person, like I'm not the world's most extroverted person, but there's just something more satisfying there. And I think what brought me into data was being able to help people make better decisions, being able to help companies make better decisions, you know, eliminating waste, having society move in a more, let's say, rational decision that's data driven. That's kind of what brought me into data. And then my personal piece is now like what keeps me going is like if I can help other people train and upskill and get those jobs and then move society so that they will go work in their companies and move society towards a more data driven, logical, less emotional, more efficient, more prosperous direction. Mm -hmm. Like I'm all for that. So that's kind of how I think about my role within data and what data can do for society. Okay, perfect. Uh, one final question for all of you. What is the one big piece of advice from your own experience that you would give someone who is starting out their data science journey or their, for Avery and Nick, you know, you might be working more on interviews, but what is that one piece of advice that you would give someone? I can start. Careers are really long. Basically the point was when I was like 22, I was like, shit, I'm so behind. Look at how everyone else is so ahead. 
And now that I'm 27, I'm like, wait, I have some experience, but I'm still just starting out. And if I wanted to change things up, I can. But I think when I was 22, I was like, oh, I have all my shit figured out by 27. So I just want to put that out there that the biggest thing is like your career is long. So if you're getting into data at age 30, you still have a good 20, 25, 30 years to work, right? It's okay to be entering data right now, even if you're in 30s, your 40s or 50s, because careers are really long and um, career data is here to stay for a long time. So it's worth the investment, even if you're a little bit older or it's okay, even if you didn't study all the right things in undergrad or in master's. It's worth investing and in taking the slow road because it'll work out eventually and your career is a long yeah. ways to go. Avery, you look like you want to go next. Yeah, I'll go next. I think the advice I would tell someone like to myself, you know, seven years ago would be the importance of just getting your foot in the door. I mean, skills, technical skills matter a lot, but a lot of the times when it comes to getting a job, it's more about your projects and your network. And so just getting your foot in the door is like, in my opinion, once you get your foot in the door, the rest of the door eventually opens and it can be a lot of work trying to open the door if you don't get your foot in there, but just getting your foot in the door, it opens up so many worlds. So I would just advise people, you know, instead of taking, you know, 473 different Python courses, like try to figure out how to get your foot in the door instead. <laughs> yeah, I, I can go next. So that's one to the advice this was given to me. A lot of people say be fearless. Uh, to me, that's strong. Everybody is afraid of something. So I say this advice almost to anything is to have that courage to when you are seeing something which you had certain goals or certain skills and all of that in that moment when you feel like you're going to give up have that courage to keep going and staying persistent. So if it's 10 minutes of your time, 15 minutes of the time a day for that skill or goal that you have, set it aside and, and keep working towards that. Anything that I've seen through many, many, many folks in careers, uh, people who have been persistent towards their goals are successful over time. That's just proven. So whatever goals you have, stay persistent, spend time on it, 10 minutes a day, five minutes a day, 15 minutes a day, whatever that is, and then have that courage to go on if you fail or learn from that. Yeah, Thank you. Last is, going last is hard, guys, on this one, but <laughs> um, that's okay. Um, no, I think I'll, I will say something that I wish I would have told, like if I've future self went back in time and told, I would say hard work is hard work. You can put in the time, but you have to believe in yourself as well, right? On this journey or anything you do in life, uh, the harder it is, you know, the more failure you're going to face. And I think you have to understand that, what's that phrase? That the master has failed more times than the beginner has tried so putting in the effort persistence, like Mosma mentioned, is important. But just as important is you also have to believe that your efforts will amount to something. And sometimes that's really hard because when you repeatedly put yourself out there every day and you're getting rejected or you're being told that you're not smart enough or not capable enough, right? It's very hard to push through that. Right? It's very hard to internalize the voice that, no, I can do this, right? So speaking as someone who got a lot of that <laughs> going from HR to data science and being, yeah, going from HR to data science, I would say, hey, let's keep going, keep pushing. You're given the same 24 hours as everyone else in the day. And it's no one's choice, but your own what you want to do with it or what you choose to do with it. If you have a goal and it means so much to you, right, then you got to keep pushing for it. I wish I had told myself that in the late 20s. I wouldn't have had such a big chip <laughs> on my shoulder, but that was for the audience. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Jimmy, Mazma, Avery, uh, Nick, always a pleasure having you all and all of the preparation that you put in before this.